my shoes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the Dean, to Dr. Kavain uh, for all her efforts to get me here, to President Cruzado. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be in a room with so many Boricuas. And, I, you know, I used to cover Puerto Rico for the Wall Street Journal. So I spent a lot of time on the island and, uh, and love it. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, the, Montana uh, has uh, had a very contentious uh, relationship with uh, immigrants. I, I don't quite understand why, because there aren't that many that many here, uh, but uh, there, there, there's about five, fewer than 5,000 undocumented immigrants in the state. Uh, uh, that's about 0.3% of the population compared to about 4% nationwide. 2% of the population here is foreign born. The Latino population is going up from about 1.5% in 1990 to about, uh, uh, about 3% uh, today. So that is uh, rising fairly rapidly. But uh, there have been all these anti-immigrant laws. There seems to be a lot of fervor on this issue in your legislature and among your uh, <laughs> your politicians and yet uh, I'm, I'm a little confused as to why but uh, anyway I hope that uh, uh, it, I will stir the pot some on this issue and we can get a good discussion going about uh, this thorny issue of immigration um, I've always seen myself as a really uh, determined person you know and that was just kind of how I saw myself that it was just kind of part of my DNA, my genetic matter. Uh, immigrants are folks who are willing to leave all the things that they dearly know and love, here are my Argentine hands, I'm sorry, uh, and, and fling themselves out into the complete unknown, a very hard thing to do. Imagine if you left Montana and were plunked into some other country where you didn't know the language or anyone and you had to start all over. And my family has done this repeatedly. Um, my father's family, uh, they fled uh, Christian persecution in Syria to go to Argentina. My mother's Jewish family uh, fled Poland before World War II uh, to go to Argentina. My mother was nine years old when she left Poland. And then both of my parents left Argentina where they had grown up to uh, come to the United States. Like most immigrants, um, this was my dad on his first day of arrival, uh, they were coming here in search of opportunity. Uh, and uh, for my father, he was a biochemist. He was uh, looking to do early genetic mapping in the United States. So um, there were a couple of things that stoked that, um, that, that determination I, I already had in my genes, that doggedness. Um, when I was a kid growing up mostly in Kansas, um, I didn't really like, and I've admitted this to the largest gathering of English teachers, said this to 3,000 English teachers. Okay, here it goes. Uh, I didn't really like studying or reading anything for that matter. Um, <clears throat> I like doing this in Kansas. Um, I was very athletic, jumped barrel race with a crop between my uh, lips. And um, m my father so clearly uh, favored my sister. Uh, she, you know, I tended to, uh, I loved to come home just reeking of manure. It, it really goaded my sister. And he, he loved my sister because she was the straight A student, um, valedictorian, goody two shoes. And he would call me the stupid jock of the family. So I had a very powerful motivator. I was going to prove him. Uh, wrong. Then when I was 13, my dad suddenly died of a heart attack and um, my mother decided to take us all back to Argentina. Um, she didn't really like the United States. This comes as a great shock to many college students. You know, we're taught that everyone wants to live in America. It's the greatest nation on earth, right? Well, no. Um, many immigrants would actually, I, I, you know, hate to break it to you, but would la rather live where they're from with everything they know and love. And that's how my mother felt. Unfortunately, she schlepped us all back. At a, her timing was really bad. Um, it was the middle of the 1970s, the beginning of the so-called dirty war in Argentina. The military was just about to take power and they would disappear, uh, that's a euphemism for kill, about 30,000 people in the coming uh, few years. Um, I lived in fear every day when I was 14, 15 years old. They would roam the streets, the military, in these cars, unmarked, and they would pluck people up, never to be seen again. And uh, it didn't take much to get targeted. If you had a beard, 
that was a problem. If you were a teacher or a professor, especially psychologists, um, you were all commies. Uh, and uh, they certainly didn't like anyone who was advocating uh, for a more just society. Uh, I, I always uh, took to walking to school with my best friend in pairs. If one of us got snatched, hopefully the other one could run and tell our parents what had just happened. Uh, a 17-year-old, very close family member of mine, picked up, tortured for a month, held in jail in very difficult conditions for nearly a year. And as the only American in my family, everyone else was born in Argentina, uh, I was lobbying Secretary of State Kissinger and congressional leaders when I was 14 to try and save her life. Uh, they killed a good friend of mine. He was 16 years old. We later heard that they uh, broke all the bones in his face. As um, Bridget mentioned, I was walking down the streets of Buenos Aires one day, and I saw this puddle of blood on the sidewalk. I was walking with my mother and asked her, what happened here? And she said that the military had killed a couple of journalists. And I said, uh, why? And she said, well, they were trying to tell people the truth about what's going on here. And so in what was clearly um, my somewhat demented 14-year-old mind, I have to tell you my nickname from the age of three was La Granuja, the troublemaker, so I already had kind of a rep. Uh, I decided, staring at that blood, I was going to be a journalist, too. I was going to be a truth teller. Um, to me, it was obvious, you know, that the military were, was able to do this because there was this vacuum of information. People really didn't understand the magnitude of what was happening all around them. Uh, knowledge, what your professors try to impart, was considered so dangerous, they were willing to kill a whole lot of people to keep the society ignorant. And I realized then, um, it, you know, you can't have a thriving democracy, whether it's there or here, and I fear what's happening to our press now, the demise of our press, it, it, it won't work unless you uh, have a, a, a strong press that's willing to hold people in power uh, accountable. Um, I was only 14 years old, but you know, I, I already understood the power of words and the power of telling st certain stories. Um, my family returned to the U.S. not long after that, when I was 15. But the lesson of seeing that blood, it, it never left me. And it made me pretty tenacious to tell stories that I, I hope would matter in some way. Um, that, that was my goal. I had no idea how I would do this. Um, my mother, father's death took my family from middle class to working poor. Mom never went beyond high schools. She had four kids to raise, so she went to work as a seamstress, minimum wage cook. I went to work at 15, busing tables to help her pay uh, no bills, the bills. Uh, I, I was a good student in high school, but I think because I was the only one with this skin color in my high school in Kansas, uh, not one counselor suggested I go to college. Luckily, my boyfriend did, and I ended up following him to Williams College, which is often ranked number one in U.S. news, top liberal arts school in the U.S. Um, so when I got there, and some of you might feel this way if you're starting out here, I, I, I felt completely overwhelmed. Uh, I had gone to a mediocre high school, had um, never written a paper longer than three pages, and you could count on my two hands the number of books I had ever uh, cracked open and read. So these kids, they had all gone to Andover, Exeter, best prep schools, perfect SATs. Um, it seemed to me they had been writing papers since they were in diapers and that at least half of them were like directly descended from the Mayflower. Um, I had, a friend of my boyfriend's daddy owned Seagram's, the liquor conglomerate, when he wanted to just come on by and say hello to Junior, he would park his helicopter uh, right in the quad. Um, so I went to this college with no help from my mom financially. She couldn't. I got grants, I worked, and I was one of five Latinos on the whole campus. And I told myself, Sonia, there ain't no way you're making it through one year of this, much less four. But at some point, that, that determination kicked in. And I told myself, you know what? These students are no smarter than I am. They're just way more prepared. So you're going to have to work harder and find mentors to help you catch up. I ended up graduating um, with honors, 
And yeah, we used to think those glasses were fashionable back then. Uh, and uh, I went back a few years ago to uh, give the convocation at Williams. At 21, I was hired as what I was told the youngest reporter ever at the Wall Street Journal, business paper. Uh, but I managed to focus on what I wanted to do, write about social issues and social justice issues and people I feel don't get enough ink in this country. Women, children, the poor, and Latinos. I had no idea how to write a story, so I globbed onto any person in that newsroom who could teach me. And I became an expert in what's called uh, fly-on-the-wall reporting. What I love doing, I'd rather put a bullet in my head than interview people on a telephone. I love like throwing myself right in the middle of the action and watching that action unfold. I love grabbing people by the throat and taking them inside what at the Wall Street Journal we used to call DBIs, dull but important issues. And uh, I think um, that putting people in the middle of action brings an immediacy and a power to telling stories that you just uh, can't get any other way. So um, doing this kind of reporting took me into some pretty uh, difficult, gnarly as we say in California, places. Uh, I covered the wars in Central America in the 80s. Uh, I covered um, riots in different parts of the United States. I spent way too much time inside crack houses. So I, I knew that I was lacking in many, many different qualities. There's a whole lot of stuff that I'm bad at. And my husband was highlighting some of those things just last night as we were traveling here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, determination was not one of them. I thought I had ganas, as we Latinos say, by the truckload. Um, but then one day I had a conversation with this woman and she would take me on a journey that would teach me what real determination is. Gadamin used to clean my house twice a month in LA where I live. And one morning I asked her, are you thinking about having any more children? I thought she just had one uh, young son. And um, Gadamin was normally this incredibly chatty and happy woman. But when I asked this question, she just went completely silent and started sobbing in my kitchen. And she told me uh, that she had left four children behind in Guatemala that I knew nothing about. She said, Sonia, I I I'm a single mom. My husband, he left me for another woman. Most days I could feed my children once, sometimes twice. But at night, they'd start crying with hunger. I had nothing to give them. I still remember she showed me in my kitchen that morning how she would gently coax her kids to roll over in bed at night, and she would tell them, sleep face down so your stomach doesn't growl so much. She told me she had left her four children with their grandmother in Guatemala, come north to work in LA. She told me she hadn't seen her children in 12 years. So can you imagine that with your parents? She said her daughter was a year old still breastfeeding when she had walked away from her. Gadamin's answer just stunned me. I mean, I could not comprehend, and I don't have kids, but I still couldn't comprehend, what level of desperation would it take for a mom to walk away, go 2,000 miles north? She had no idea when, if she would ever see those children again. And I stood in my kitchen and I said, Sonia, what would you do? Would you stay, love, protect them? They wouldn't eat and they'd only go to the third grade. That's what she was able to do. Or leave as painful as that is, knowing that in a material sense, my children would be better off. Um, and it was that question in my kitchen that would send me on a quite amazing journey uh, to Central America, up the migrant routes through Mexico. And I would spend a whole lot of time interviewing women who were just like my house cleaner, uh, really all across the United States. Um, a lot of these women, as I talked to them, told me that when they came here, they took care of other people's children. Um, they said, I uh, play with this boy I, I take care of as a nanny or in childcare. I take him to the park, I feed him, I love him but I wasn't there to hear my own son's first words, see my daughter take her first steps. I wasn't there for my daughter's quinceanera. I, I sent the dress south, but I couldn't be there on that crucial uh, day for my daughter. 
But as I started to look at this, I found what my house cleaner was telling me was unbelievably common. In LA, a study showed that four out of every five live-in nannies, they still have a child left behind in their home countries. Um, I started to dig in, and what I saw was that there was more and more family disintegration, divorce throughout Latin America. And that has transformed the face of who's coming now to Montana. I, I thought undocumented immigrants, they're, they're mostly men, right? Well, no. Today, 51% of the folks coming here who are here unlawfully are actually women and children. So there had been this uh, sea change. These women, they're part of the largest wave of immigration in our nation's history. So if your legislators have their hair on fire, uh, this is one reason. Between 1990 and 2010, 27 million people came here legally and not, numerically more than at any other time in our history. A million people come here legally or become permanent residents every year. So say what you will about us, we allow more legal migration than any nation on earth. And despite our struggling economy, maybe not so struggling here, but elsewhere, uh, 200,000 people are coming here every year without permission. And that is down more than three quarters from the high in 2007 when the recession began. If you look at K through 12 schools nationwide, one in four kids now is either an immigrant or child of an immigrant. That will rise, I know there's a school of education here, that will rise to 30% uh, just in a few years. It is the fastest growing group of children in this country. Um, so I went into a lot of these women's homes. Every single one I interviewed told me the same story. They said, Sonia, the only way I could walk away from that day, I, I gave my kids a promise. I said, mijo, uh, this, I'm going to be gone one, two years, no more. They didn't realize that life here is a tad tougher than advertised. And you know, I know this as a child of immigrants. When folks call home, they tend to puff up all the good stuff out of pride. They talk about how I make eight bucks an hour and I have a car. No one in my pueblito has a car. What they don't say is I'm working two jobs. I'm stuffed in an apartment with uh, three other families living in a converted garage, struggling to pay my bills here, send a hundred bucks home to my kids every month, and I've got to save $8,000 to put in the smuggler's hand to bring each of my children north. This is never one or two years. I found these separations stretch five, ten years typically, sometimes more. These kids get desperate to be with their mothers again. So they get this idea, all right, she's not coming back for me or sending for me. I'm going to go and find her. Um, I started looking at this phenomenon in 2000. We heard about this surge in these unaccompanied immigrant children this summer. This is nothing new. 2000, I've been looking at this for 15 years. And back then I calculated there was a small army of children coming north from Mexico, Central America, with no parent entering the United States unlawfully. 48,000 kids in that year. Um, and uh, we'll talk at the end about how um, th these numbers have, have risen and how the reasons for these kids coming has changed so dramatically. But they're coming right now as I'm speaking. Back then, they were coming to work, fleeing abusive situations in countries that really don't have functioning child welfare systems. And the vast majority were coming to find a parent, a mom who had left them behind. So as some of you know, I wrote about this army of children through one true story. Enrique uh, from Honduras, his mother leaves him. He's just five years old when she walks away. This was his kindergarten mugshot shortly after she left him in Honduras to come and work in California. He is just devastated by her absence, her sudden departure. He begs his paternal grandma, who he's left with, ¿Cuándo vuelve mi mami? Is she coming back? Um, he told me when he was 11, 12 years old, Christmas morning, he would plant himself at the door of his grandma's wooden shack. He would put his hands together and pray and tell God, I just want one present. Bring her back to me. He goes from being a lonely boy to honestly a fairly troubled teen without his mother there. After 11 years of not seeing her, he, he sets off to go and find her. This is what he looked like uh, before leaving. 
He had two things. They're the same things all these kids have on them. Um, a little scrap of paper with his mother's phone number inked on it. I would see on these migrant routes, these kids, they would hide that in that slip of paper in the sole of their shoe, waistband of their jeans, wrap it in plastic so when it rained or they crossed rivers, hopefully that precious number wouldn't smudge. He's got his number, his scrap of paper, and that question. Does she really love me? Because she said she would return or send for me, and she didn't. He's virtually penniless, so he goes the only way he can, gripping on to the tops and sides of these freight trains that travel up the length of Mexico. Uh, I found that there were thousands of kids every year making this journey in search of their mothers in the U.S. The youngest I heard about, seven years old, and the youngest boy I traveled with, he was traveling by himself, 12-year-old Dennis, uh, with his Tweety Bird t-shirt on, his mother left him when he was a year old. And at 12, he would cross four countries by himself to actually reach her in San Diego, California. I think your parents wouldn't let you go even here in uh, Bozeman, safe Bozeman, right, to, to the grocery store alone at those ages. Um, quite amazing what these young children do. It, it, it's an incredible adventure. They have no, Enrique had no idea where the United States was. He just knew to follow the arc of the sun. It is harrowing beyond anything I could have conjured up in my imagination, in my brain. Uh, most of these kids end up back in their home country after something really bad has happened to them in Mexico, and there's a lot of possibilities. Um, many of them are killed along the way. They are torn apart by the train wheels as they travel through Mexico. And from the moment they cross this river, the Suchate, that divides um, Guatemala, the mountains, and Mexico, they step on Mexican soil. They are hunted like animals all the way through Mexico. Uh, they face bandits alongside the rails. This was the most famous checkpoint in the south of Mexico when I traveled, when Enrique traveled um, in Chiapas. The authorities would stop the train there. Mexican authorities try to grab everyone. The task was to get around this checkpoint, three miles, get on the train as it's moving on the other side. Three to five swarms of bandits waiting for you. They are armed with machetes, guns, knives. They will rob you, rape you, and oftentimes kill you. Uh, I counted a dozen police agencies in Mexico, corrupt cops, targeting these migrants, including these kids. I'd watch, they'd stop the train, rob you of your hat, shoes, any coins, sometimes rape the girls deport you to the southern border. So uh, we're not the only country deporting a lot of people. Mexico deported 107,000 Central Americans uh, just last year. And if those two things don't get you, the, the train oftentimes uh, will. Um, many readers of Enrique's journey have done amazing things, including um, someone in the US forced his friend in who's high levels of Mexican government to pass a law allowing Central Americans to uh, migrate freely through Mexico. That senior official died in a mysterious helicopter accident. Uh, the law has never been implemented. So you still have to get, you can't get on at the train station still. You have to get on and off these trains as they're moving uh, because you're still crossing Mexico illegally if you're Central American. And you can take my word for it because I've done it. Uh, this is a lot harder than it looks. Uh, these rail beds slant at 45 degrees. They're made up of big rocks. Um, the first rung of the train uh, ladder for these kids is at their waist, even higher if this train is banking away from them. So it's very hard to pull yourself up. You're trying to elude the immigration authorities. Enrique's cousin came up last summer that he said there were 1,500 people on his train. He had a hard time finding one piece of metal uh, to grab onto. Um, and way too many of these folks do not do this successfully. I spent time in a shelter in the south of Mexico for people mutilated by trains. And it's hard for me to express what it's like to walk in. It is rooms that are filled with people who have lost arms, uh, feet like Fausto, uh, legs like this 14-year-old boy to um, that freight train. I think many of us here in the US have heard how hard it is to cross um, this border, the border 2,000 miles that we share with Mexico. And that is hard. About 400 people die every year trying to do that. Uh, but the Central Americans will tell you this here is a cakewalk compared to getting through Mexico, especially the southernmost state of Chiapas. 
Those kids would tell me when they'd start going through Chiapas, ahora nos enfrentamos a la bestia. Now we face the beast. Uh, to give you a sense of what the worst of this is for these children, there are these gangsters that control the train tops. Many of these guys were deported um, by the United States. Um, MS-13, 18th Street Gang. 18th Street is Mexican gang in LA. When the war started in Central America in the 80s, many Central Americans came north. The Mexicans would pick on the Central Americans. They started their own gang, MS-13. In 1996, when we toughened laws towards permanent residents who had committed certain crimes, like DUIs, we started deporting these guys by the truckload. We've deported about 300,000 to Central America. Uh, and uh, they, um, they, in Central America, when the cops see you all tatted up, they shoot first and ask questions later. So it's not a good place to hang out. So they moved north. And they found a good business robbing migrants on top of these trains. I would see 10 or 20 of these guys on top of every train. And they would go, I'd watch them from car to car, surround a group of migrants and say, your money or your life, strip you of your clothes, um, you know, uh, sometimes rape the girls, and if they couldn't find any coins, they were hopped up on crack cocaine or just crazy, they would throw you down to those churning wheels below. This happens to Enrique one night. He's on top of that train. Six guys creep up the ladder, throw him face down, beat his face with a wooden club, shatter his teeth, strip his clothes, no money, beat him harder. One of these thugs starts to strangle Enrique with a bit of his own clothes. He's trying to pull this away from his throat and buffer those blows coming at his face. And he hears one of these thugs yell out, just throw him off the train. And he's think thinking in his mind, I'm going to die here. My mom will have no inkling what happened to me. That train jostles for a moment, the noose loosens. He flings himself off, going 40 miles an hour. When he comes to the next day, all they've left him are his underwear, covered in blood, eyes filled with blood. These women in the town surround him and say, go home. You're going to die doing this. And he says, I can't. I have to reach my mother. Today, the Zetas, the most bloodthirsty narco cartel in Mexico, is kidnapping 18,000 Central Americans a year. These are the faces of the disappeared. They prefer to snatch children off the train. They use that scrap of paper to demand ransom from parents here in Montana, three to $5,000. If you uh, don't pay, sometimes even if you do pay, they'll just kill you. I came to understand um, the level of determination these children must have because I did all of this journey uh, myself. I met Enrique, he was all the way up in Nuevo Laredo, right across from Laredo, Texas, um, and was just so moved by what he had been through. I was, uh, he was on attempt number eight to reach his mother to cross Mexico. He was sleeping outside on the muddy banks of the Rio Grande uh, on a wet mattress, uh, eating once a day, trying to survive. And I wanted to show what this journey was like. So I, he, he told me everywhere he had been on those eight attempts. I went back to his grandma's house and did the journey step by step, exactly as he had done it a few weeks before. I would travel uh, three months, 1,600 miles, on top of seven freight trains up the length of Mexico. Um, I'm not completely nuts. I see some of you looking at me like that girl's a little whack. Uh, I took as many precautions as possible, got a letter from the personal assistant to the president of Mexico, kept me out of jail three times along the way. Uh, but still, despite many safety nets, this was a high stakes ride. I mean, I had spent weeks inside ICE detention facilities for children coming into the United States by themselves. By the way, we now have 83 detention facilities spread across 12 states for unaccompanied immigrant children, to give you a sense of the magnitude of this now. And I asked these kids, please tell me every bad thing that happens everywhere on that map, because yours truly would really like to avoid all of those things. Uh, somehow none of them mentioned that there are these branches in the south of Mexico, it's very lush, jungle-like, uh, and uh, that envelop the tops of the train. This was my first train ride, pitch dark, I'm on a rounded fuel tanker, um, there's a hundred migrants atop this train and me, and the ones closest to the locomotive start yelling back a warning, rama. 
I couldn't hear what the heck they were saying. This train is unbelievably loud. And uh, I'm holding on with both hands because it bucks violently from side to side. I didn't hear a warning. This huge branch, it smacked me right in the face and it sent me uh, sprawling back almost off this train. I grabbed onto the rail on the top side of the car and pulled myself back up on top. When it stopped the next day, it was a branch a little, definitely bigger than this one. Uh, there were two kids on the car behind mine. Another boy with them was swiped off by the same branch that got me. And they said he's probably dead. When these trains move forward, they produce sucking wind underneath that pulls you into the wheels as you um, fall down. I could tell you about many other near misses. I'll just say, um, you know, I did this journey twice, three months each time. And when I got home to LA after the first three months, I was having a nightmare every single night that this gangster was running after me on top of the train. Um, and he was trying to rape me because somebody did try to grab me on top of the train. And luckily I was able to get away from him. Uh, and I had to go into therapy for about six months. Uh, we Latinos don't believe in therapy. Eso es para gente. No estoy loca. I'm not crazy. Uh, except for Argentines. We're the most therapied people on earth. But uh, we have a hi higher per capita rate of therapy than any other nation. But uh, So I went into therapy and I can attest to that it, it helped um, to make that nightmare stop. I felt tense and filthy and in fear of being robbed or beaten or raped many days on this train. In the south, it's so hot I couldn't touch the train. It would burn my hands. And in the north, it's so cold. These kids would freeze to death on that train. And I would watch them do all sorts of wacky things around me to try uh, not to freeze to death. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you told yourself, this is so bad, I can't take another moment of this. That's how I felt. But eventually, this sucker would stop. And I'd get off. and pull out some pesos and eat some tacos and sleep in a warm bed in a motel. I knew that these kids like Enrique had none of those advantages and that I had been through 1% of what they go through. He's, Enrique slept in sewage culverts to hide from the immigration authorities, trees to protect themselves from predatory animals. He told me, Sonia, I, I went two days without one drop of water. I felt like my throat was swelling shut. He had to beg, like this boy is doing, for whatever food he could get along the way. Um, I could have never imagined that kind of determination. But to him, every obstacle was nothing compared to his yearning, uh, his desperate yearning, to see and be with his mother again. You know, I saw people equally determined in a different way. I think a very instructive way for all of us to live their faith, to live a life of compassion in Mexico, no matter how hard it was for many folks that I saw. Uh, Chiapas, the southernmost state, it felt like the heart of darkness to me. Most children rob, beaten, or raped before they get out of the first of 13 states they have to cross. But I have to tell you, the south central state of Veracruz it lifted my faith in humanity after what I had seen. Because here, where there's a curve in the tracks, for some reason, this thing has to slow down. In these little pueblitos, when people heard that whistle of the train, I would see 10 or 30 people run out of their huts with these bundles of food in their arms. And they'd all start waving and smiling and shouting to these migrants on top of the train. They threw uh, bread, tortillas sandwiches, whatever fruit is in season. Enrique got oranges. I was pummeled by large branches of bananas and rolls of crackers. Uh, no food, they gave tap water. No water, I'd watch them line up next to the tracks, put their hands together. They'd say a silent prayer for these migrants as they pass by. I was so moved by this spectacle. That woman makes a dollar a day could barely feed her own children, but was giving a little of what she had to complete strangers from other lands. And she and all of these folks told me the same thing. I am doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's the Christian thing to do. I may not have read the 92 references to the stranger in the Old Testament, but I know this is what Jesus would do if he were standing in my shoes. 
the best part of this journey was um, Maria. As a grizzled investigative reporter, Maria was a little troubling at first. She started our conversation with um, that she was 132 years old. <laughs> All right, okay, can we get past that, Sonia? Uh, she said that during the Mexican Revolution in 1910, so hungry, she ate the bark of the plantain tree in her front yard. Her hands were gnarled with age. She would force them to make little bags with tortillas, beans, salsa, whatever she had in this hut. When she heard that whistle, she would foist these all on her 70-year-old daughter. Soledad would run down that rocky slope, and you see the train tracks, she would heave these up to the migrants on that train. I'll always remember what she said that day to me. If I have one tortilla, I will give half away. I know God will bring me more. I met some incredible heroes like Francisca, very poor, sweater full of holes, missing all her front teeth. That's why she's refusing to smile for my terrible photo. Uh, that's her whole hut. She, she manages, despite what she makes, to give food four times a day to migrants, strangers. Uh, this is her whole hut, and she's managed to scrunch three beds into this, this one-room place, and she and her two children sleep on one and a half beds, and every night she allows three migrants who she met that morning to sleep in the other one and a half beds. That's living your faith. Enrique makes eight attempts, 122 days, 12,000 miles in what I think can only be described as a modern day odyssey. Um, we've heard about the surge this summer and these kids coming. That looks surge-like, right? Uh, 69,000 apprehended in fiscal uh, 2014. Uh, that doesn't count about 15,000 Mexican kids that are just tossed over the, back over the border within three days. It doesn't count the ones they don't catch, so the numbers are much greater. This is a tenfold increase in, in three years that we have seen. I think today, more than ever, um, we should take our cues on what to do, not from those who wish these children the worst, but from um, people who think like the folks in Veracruz that I saw. Why? Because these kids are coming for very different reasons than Enrique came um, more than a decade ago. The UN recently found that six in 10 of these children coming now, the primary driver for leaving their homelands in Central America is violence. They have been threatened once, twice, three times, and they likely merit international protection. That 58% is up from 13% who answered in that way back in 2006. So escalating uh, violence. Um, Instead of giving these kids international protection, I was upset last summer to hear uh, congressional leaders talk about this wave of criminal six-year-olds, um, who this, these unwashed hordes of uh, toddlers at our border waiting to bring Ebola to each and every one of us and that they should all be dispatched back to where uh, they had come from. Uh, did you know that Honduras has the number one homicide rate in the world, and El Salvador and Guatemala are not far behind? Honduras has homicide levels that are four times what Mexico is experiencing. Um, the U.S., that's you and I as taxpayers, spent about $8 billion as part of Plan Colombia to disrupt the flow of cocaine coming up the Caribbean corridor. The top map is 2007. You see all those red drug flights going from uh, Colombia and Venezuela up to Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti. That's where they used to fly, uh, all those drugs. Uh, this is 2011. You can see they're going up and they're taking a sharp turn to the left. So what did our $8 billion do? It disrupted that flow, but they simply rerouted to the left. And four out of every five cocaine flights are now uh, landing in Honduras. Um, so when I returned to Honduras last summer to report for the New York Times, what I saw was a viciousness and a reach of this gang and narco violence that honestly, it just astounded me what I saw. Uh, these narcos and the gangs that are reporting to them, the, the narco cartels are from Mexico, mostly the Sinaloa and the Zeta cartels, uh, are targeting children in Enrique's neighborhood. I spent a week living in his grandmother's house. And uh, they are kidnapping them, they are beheading them in his neighborhood, they are skinning children alive. Children like Christian, 
This 11-year-old boy told me he had to get out now, even if he had to ride that train. He has been threatened coming out of his elementary school. The narcos say, you're going to start using crack cocaine because they want to get him hooked. They want to um, get them selling, uh, working as lookouts in the neighborhood. They want to get them selling drugs and ultimately working as sicarios, killing people for the cartels in Honduras. Uh, he knows three people in the first half of last year who were murdered, youngsters, and um, including an 11-year-old girl clubbed over the head by two narcos, dragged off, they cut a hole in her throat, stuffed her panties in it, and left her broken body in a ravine across the street from where he lives. They are recruiting um, children to be their foot soldiers, um, to control this turf, to move these drugs north through Honduras. Um, his father was also killed by the gangs the year before. The flow of kids has changed. It is younger. Half of the children caught in Mexico heading north, unaccompanied, are 12 and younger now. And 40% are girls. It used to only be one in four were girls. Parents didn't want to bring their girls because, you know, you, even if you bring them with the smuggler, they're passed from smuggler to smuggler, and you don't know if smuggler number three is going to rape your daughter. But now they're willing to take that risk because girls like Milagro in Enrique's neighborhood, she's pretty, she's got green eyes. The head of the gang and the head of the narco are telling her, you're going to be my girlfriend or I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill, wipe out your whole family. And as she told me that day, it's better to leave than to have them kill me here in Honduras. I think we can have a different perspective on what should be done about this very difficult issue of um, illegal immigration. Um, and some of you may disagree with me on that. Uh, I think we can have a full-throated debate about the pluses and what I see as some minuses to this influx that we've had in recent decades, uh, especially when we're talking about um, migrants who come primarily for a better life. I call them economic migrants. Honestly, uh, this massive influx uh, in recent decades has created winners but some losers. I see it as an issue with many shades of gray. The longer I look at migration, the more murky it gets. There are huge benefits to this influx. Uh, migrants do jobs others don't want to do. Uh, I don't know if you're willing to work in these dairy farms here in Montana. The work starts at what, 5 a.m. and it continues until the cows need to be milked uh, all through, you know, up until uh, night, right? And it doesn't pay that great. Most Americans, honestly, don't want to do those jobs anymore. I don't know if you spent time on a kill floor of a meat packing plant, a poultry plant. These are highly unpleasant places to work for $10, $12 an hour. Most economists agree that migrants help drive our $16 trillion economy. They also agree that 5% of all goods and services bought by everyone in this room are cheaper because of immigrant labor. Cheaper clothing, food, childcare, etc. That means more of us can avail ourselves of those things. And I believe that migrants prevent many businesses from shutting down altogether or outsourcing many more jobs if they had to pay a higher wage to attract an all-American workforce. Those meatpacking plants would have to pay 20, 25 bucks an hour to get all-Americans to work on those kill floors. And could Americans afford beef at that price? Or would the producers realize they can't and will shut this down and just import beef from Argentina or Brazil or China and all the economic activity around that plant uh, would be lost? But there are losers. And unfortunately, they're the most socially disadvantaged in this country. The one in 14 Americans who don't have a high school degree, who have been forced to compete with um, immigrants in certain industries and have seen their wages drop by 7% over 20 years because of that competition. That's mostly African Americans and previous waves of Latino immigrants. Construction, a lot of immigrants came here to build things, right? Well, one in seven construction workers are undocumented in this country. One in four ruferos, roofers. I would argue Americans are willing to work in construction if they're paid a living wage to do that. Uh, the second group that's really been harmed are migrants, and no one really talks about this. Um, it is absolutely true. If you bring, if you come here as a mom, you are going to send money home, and your kid will eat 
and they will study. And that's huge. I don't want to minimize that. But it's equally true. If you leave your kid for 10 years, I can guarantee it. They will resent and walk up to the line of hating you for leaving them. They don't understand it. They say, I would have rather had mom by my side to love and protect me than had her in the US sending the Nike shoes and yeah, even the money to be able to eat. And I think what's tragic is a lot of these mothers, they lose the most precious thing, which is the love of their children. I think instead of the same three tired approaches that have been proffered by the left and the right and are the same components of comprehensive immigration reform, we need to find a way to keep more migrants where they'd rather be in their home countries. And we need to improve conditions in four countries that are sending um, the vast majority of migrants here unlawfully. We must tackle this exodus at its source. Three solutions will permanently slow the flow. They have been a failure in the past, and I sincerely doubt they will work in the future. We've tried border, uh, border enforcement on steroids. You know, we spend $18 billion a year on this now, 10 times what we did when the crackdown began in the 90s. Hired a lot of Border Patrol agents. President Obama has deported about 400,000 people per year. What has this accomplished? 97% of folks who try to get past that stupid wall we built are able to do so. Uh, 10 years ago, half of the Mexicans who came here went home within a year. They want to go home. But now, only a quarter go home within a year. It's getting tougher to get in. Smuggling rates keep going up. They come and they stay. Knowing that they're going to stay, they bring their families more quickly. That's caused the numbers to go up. What about um, guest worker programs? Guest workers are supposed to come and go home after a while. More than half did not go home under our largest guest worker program, the Braceros. And that created the foundation of the wave of migration that followed from Mexico. What about legalization? And this would be great. I know your, your state troopers have been out there pulling over migrants and having them live in utter terror in recent years. Uh, and people are living in enormous fear. So legalization would be wonderful for migrants. But we last did this in 1986. We went from 3 million to 1 million to now 12 million. Um, they all brought their friends and family members without permission. And I'm not strong on math, but I would say that did not exactly work as our political leaders uh, advertised. Uh, I think instead of this approach, we need to push our government to uh, bring every tool we have at our disposal to creating a foreign policy that is centered around changing conditions in these four countries. We need to elevate good governance, strengthen governments, economic development, reduce corruption, and reduce violence in these four countries. And maybe in the Q&A I can get into some of these elements of this foreign policy that I think uh, would accomplish this. The time to push for this is right now. They are debating in Congress a tripling of foreign aid to Central America to $1 billion. And there's a letter on my website, if you agree with me, that you can send your congressional leaders uh, pushing on spending money on these sorts of things instead of um, walls that simply don't work. Um, let me end by saying equally important to this long-term approach of changing things in these places is the need to help these children who are at our border, who are knocking at our door, who are asking for help. They are asking for safety from harm. They are refugees. I'm heartened that President Obama last November announced a measure that will mean that fewer citizen children, kids born in this country, will be separated from their undocumented parents. But let's be really clear. This administration has at the same time thrown these recent child arrivals right under the bus. They are aiding and abetting Republicans in this endeavor. Uh, the president has disgracefully announced that most of these kids are going to be sent back to their countries that they came from. Yep, we've signed all these protocols that we will help refugees. That is someone who is uh, fleeing their countries because they have been persecuted. They are fearful for their lives. And we expect, to help, uh, we expect others to help lots of refugees. Um, countries around Syria have taken in more than 3 million refugees. Uh, and we have pushed them to do that. 
But we can't take in, apparently, a few thousand, even though perhaps 60% of these children are likely refugees. Instead of acting in a humane way, um, Obama pushed to undo a 2008 law that requires that Central American kids get a full fair hearing before an immigration judge to push their asylum claim. He tried to just eliminate that right. Uh, he couldn't get that through Congress, so he pushed the immigration courts to, put, uh, to push these cases through as quickly as possible, put them at the front of the line, and push these judges to move these cases quickly. In Texas, some judges will give you a week to show up with a fully developed asylum claim. Most people will tell you it takes a year to fully develop a, an asylum case. Uh, if you're a murderer in this country, uh, you are entitled to a public counsel if you can't afford one. We've all heard that, right? But if you're an immigrant, you're not entitled to a government-funded attorney. And 70%, um, most of these kids can't afford an attorney. And so 70% of them are going before these immigration judges with no legal help at all. So imagine what I saw in LA Immigration Court. This seven-year-old boy, he's just shaking with utter fear. Uh, he is being asked to present this complex asylum claim before this judge. The government has an attorney arguing why that child should be deported. Um, asylum law is more complicated than tax law. I don't know if some of you just did your taxes. You know how complicated that is. Uh, this is way more complicated, and we're asking five and seven-year-olds to do this. Uh, ten, only ten, half of these kids are entitled to stay legally to get relief. Only 10% get that if they don't have an attorney. 70% get that if they have an attorney. I think we should all demand that our government provide every single one of these children government-funded attorneys if they can't afford one. And if not, I believe that what we're doing is a sham process. It's not due process. When for many of these children, these are life and death decisions if, if they're being deported back uh, to their home countries. I think we measure a society by how we treat children. And w what we are doing is not worthy of our court system. I think we should ask our government to stop paying Mexico tens of millions of dollars, as we did last year. We gave them $90 million last year, the Mexican government, to intercept these children and turn them back. Last year, Mexico deported 20,000 unaccompanied immigrant children, four times what they did two years before. They are doing this because our government is asking, paying, demanding that they do this. Finally, I think that we should demand that our government instead increase the number of refugees we allow to pre-9-11 levels. You know, we used to take 130,000 refugees a year. Now it's 70,000, 70,000. Um, Germany takes in three times that number, that dinky little country in Europe. Why can't we increase the number to uh, pre-9-11 levels to give these children a safe harbor uh, from harm? Um, I think um, that this moment is a true test for the US. Are we going to rise to the level of humanity that is required of us? I think we're capable of incredible, amazing things uh, if we come together with a purpose. And I saw that just the other night in McAllen, Texas, which is on the border. Members of this church, the, the Sacred Heart Catholic Church, they started to see these dirty um, women and their toddler children, immigrant women, uh, at, at the bus station near the church. Um, they had been released by the Border Patrol to go on to places in the United States, ultimately go to immigration court to see if they could stay here or not. And they started bringing these women back to this church which became this impromptu relief center, as you can see. For the first time, everyone in McAllen came together. The Episcopalians, the Jews, the Baptists, the Catholics. They went and faced down people who had come to the bus station from California, Texas, with guns. They would wave it at these women and their toddlers, telling them, you're criminals. Go home. They stared those people down. Volunteers have come to this church from 28 states in our great <coughs> union, like the a uh, couple from Pennsylvania who loaded their eight and 10 year old sons in a van, filled it with clothing and food, drove from Pennsylvania to the south end of Texas. And they all say these volunteers the same thing when they arrive at this church. I was moved and so I came. 
The women walked in that night, like this woman with her young daughter. They are completely traumatized. Uh, many of the women have been raped on this journey. They had just been held in the Border Patrol's uh, ice cold jail cells called Yeleras. Um, they were sleeping on the concrete floor with their children. Um, a three day old baby was sleeping on the concrete floor. No shower. We don't give them enough food when they're locked up. They were locked up for five days before they walked in that night. When they came through the doors, the volunteers all yelled out, Bienvenidos, welcome. It was the first time anyone had said something kind to them in the United States. And the women all started crying. Sister Norma, who's the righteous nun who runs this place, um, said she went and told uh, House Minority Speaker Nancy Pelosi, we are not doing anything political here. We are extending a hand, one human being to the other. You know, if a girl like me, um, I couldn't even write a paper when I got to college. One of all things, the Pulitzer Prize in feature writing. If uh, these people in Veracruz can give a little of what they have, if Enrique could make it to his mother's arms, I think if we all bring uh, the level of compassion that I saw, determination, to trying to give these refugee children a measure of the justice they deserve in this country, to trying to change conditions slowly but surely in these four countries, I think we can change things. And I have a whole How to Help section with suggestions for you all on my website. Pick one, do something. Uh, I think we can change things so that people like my house cleaner never have to walk away from their children again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.